Good morning, church. Good morning. Hi. Thanks for having me. My name is Mike Stella. My uh, wife, Julie, and our two daughters are here today with me, and it's, uh, it's just a pleasure. We, we attend Northridge Fellowship, and I do, um, <clears throat> I do pulpit supply there when Pastor Ben is out of town. For some of you that might know, um, Northridge is one of the churches that helped plant Mosaic, so it's, it's really fun to be part of this church here today. I'm a Bethel Seminary graduate. I'm on the board of directors for an organization called Impact Lives, and um, I'm really excited to open up our text today. Originally, Pastor Eric asked me if I would do um, Philippians chapter 4, and I was like, yeah, I mean, Philippians chapter 4 has like the signature verse of this of this book, you know, all, you know, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And then he said, well, actually, I want you to do Philippians 3. And I was like, okay. So I looked at Philippians 3 and I was like, wow. I mean, because the truth of the gospel couldn't be more clear than what we're going to see today in Philippians chapter 3. I mean, the gospel is just laid out perfectly. And, you know, Paul's prose and his genius is just on full display. So as we sit and receive the word today, um, what a gift. But before we unpack, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we are aware that we are in a safe, warm building and there are thousands, millions today over in Ukraine that are not. And we, uh, we would ask that you would cover them, you would protect them. We ask that you would come now to this place and be with us and comfort us where we're at, the things we're going through, the questions and the struggles that we're enduring. So as we open up your word, Lord, we don't take it lightly, and we invite you to come and meet us where we're at. In your name, amen. So up until about the year 1500, the prevailing view of the world was called the geocentric model. Essentially, this model was the Earth was at the center of the universe, of the solar system, and everything else revolved around it. That view of the geocentric model had been around before Christ. And up until 1500, that's just what everybody believed. But two European astronomers came along, Copernicus and Galileo, and they completely threw this idea on its head. And they said, no, based on our observable science and physics, the earth can't be at the center of the solar system. The sun must be. And everything else must revolve around the sun. Now, this new theory was faced with much resistance because some had felt this new unknown theory. And who are these guys just going to come along and completely change what we've always thought? Like, no, there there was a lot of resistance to that. And it took years and generations of time and other people observing things to finally kind of change that momentum. However, that view is still held by some. You can still find articles that believe that Jerusalem and the earth is at the center of the solar system and and the earth revolves around it. So you see it's hard to overcome a way of thinking when you've had it ingrained in you for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, the reason why I start my message this way is because we're going to see from the text, this type of inertia is what Paul's trying to overcome. Paul was coming in to the church of Philippi, and he had had planted this church, and he was explaining to them to the gospel, but there was much resistance. There was much resistance to the way that things had always been done in the Jewish faith. So Paul faced this heavy resistance to to the people of Philippi, And he was just kind of at his wit's end when we get to Philippians 3. So let's let's open up our text. I want to invite you to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read all the way through it just because it is so important and um, it's all one continual thought. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you And it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ 
and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecutor of the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever I... Whatever was to my prophet, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to take hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward, in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such, view, such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as often as I've I told you before, and now say again, even with tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. But from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Amen. <clears throat> Now, if you remember back to week one, when Pastor Eric introduced this uh, sermon series, he talked about unity. He talked about having good partnership. And the, the reality of a good partnership, a good team, whether it's, whether it's your marriage is good or your uh, people you work with or you're, you're on an actual team, there is joy when you're pulling in the same direction. There is joy when you're unified. Those go hand in hand. It's really hard to have disunity and have joy. And so when we're pulling in the same direction, when we have that inertia, you feel it. You feel the excitement. You feel the joy. In fact, I believe this is the entire point of the book of Philippians. The entire book of Philippians is centered around what you guys, what we talked about last week, what Pastor Eric talked about last week. And that is this, chapters 2, 1 through 2, when Paul says this, If any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in the same spirit and purpose. This is the entire point of Philippians, to have joy that leads to unity, being like-minded, having the same love, being of the same spirit. Everything in chapter 1 is pointing to that passage in chapter 2, and everything following it, including our message today, is pointing back to chapter 2. He's just re reiterating the point of saying, if you're going to have joy, you've got to have unity. You've got to be like-minded. You have to be of the same spirit. You have to love each other. And Paul is seeking to accomplish this by calling out those who are trying to hurt the church in chapter 3. There were people who came into the church, they infiltrated the church, and they were hurting the church. They were, they were causing disunity, and they were spreading lies, and they were leading people astray. And one thing you'll find consistent in the writings of Paul is he doesn't take this lightly. Now, we think of Peter, you know, Peter's kind of that, that brash, you know, you know, speak first, think second, take out his sword, right? We think, of, we think of Peter that way. And when we think of Paul, Paul's more cerebral, you know, more intellectual, just kind of sits back. The guy's a genius. 
Now when it comes to, I mean, that's true, but you see the passion of Paul when somebody comes into the church, tries to teach a false gospel, and tries to cause, dis, cause disunity. In 1 Corinthians, he tells the church to expel a person, kick them out of the church. He actually says, turn them over to Satan because this person was unrepentant and was causing disunity in the church. It's pretty strong, strong language. In Galatians 5, a group of men who came in, they were agitating the church, leading others astray. Others astray. He tells them to go emasculate themselves. Paul doesn't have a lot of patience for people who come into the church and cause disunity, steal joy, and teach a false gospel. In our text today, he calls them dogs. He says, watch out for these dogs, these evildoers, these people who mutilate the flesh. The word, the word dog here, it's a Greek word, um, for ku, the Greek word is kuhan. It literally means wild scavengers. These people are devour everything. They eat garbage, they eat, gar, they eat you know, uh, car, other carcasses. These are wild scavenger animals. Spiritually speaking, these people are predators who feed off of others. It's not a kind thing to be called a wild scavenger, right? Paul is not mincing words here. And the reason why he does this is because of what they were teaching. These dogs, these evildoers who are teaching, he says that they are mutilating the flesh. So what's, what's he talking about here? What's, what's this mutilating the flesh? Paul, what are you talking about? He's talking about circumcision. Paul is addressing the Jewish legalist who infiltrated the church and said, you gotta, you got to be circumcised. and you got to live according to the Mosaic law. And then you can add Christ to that. That's how you, that's how you become a saved. First, you've got to become a Jew. You've got to live according to the law. You've got to be circumcised. And then you add Christ to that. That's what they're telling this Gentile church. You can't be saved by grace alone through faith alone. You aren't found not guilty just by the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Your sins can't just be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. No, you've got to keep up with the Jewish rituals and laws and procedures. You are saved by faith and by works. Paul doesn't have a lot of patience for this. You see, this is a massive hurdle that he has to overcome. I mean, for those who thought the earth was at the center and everything circled around it, that is still, people still 500 years later are struggling with that. Some people are. Now imagine 10,000 years of believing that you have to first become a Jew in order to receive Christ, this idea of circumcision, which is a big deal, which was a huge part of the Jewish faith. I mean, that was what was told to Abraham. If you were part of the covenant, you got circumcised, uh, every male did. And if they didn't, they were outside the covenant. But the problem was, by the time this day, but in this time of Paul's time, it didn't have any real spiritual significance. It was just something they did. Most of them, some of them probably didn't even know why. But worse yet, what they were doing, some of them, they were hanging on to it as, okay, well, I was, I was, I was circumcised, and so I'm, I'm in the covenant, and I'm fine. It's almost like equivalent to us today saying, well, you know, I was baptized. I got my baptism certificate, so that's my ticket to heaven. Paul's saying, no, no, that's not how it works. You see, these people were putting their faith in their own abilities. They were putting their faith essentially in themselves. They were putting them at the center of the solar system, and God revolved around them. They are putting their faith in their works, their faith in their rituals that they did. And Paul says, listen, if anybody should have faith in what they've done, it should be me. If anybody should have faith in, in, in your resume or in your uh, culture or in your spiritual upbringing, it should be me. And then he lays out his resume. Because you want, you, want you want to compare yourself to somebody? Compare yourself to me. Look at what I have done since I've been born. Since I was circumcised on the eighth day. The literal translation of this is, as to circumcision, I was an eighth dayer. He says, I'm no Johnny come lately to the faith. I was pure from the start. You want to put confidence in the flesh? I'm an eighth dayer. I'm of the nation of Israel. Paul had the bloodline. He was a physical descendant of Abraham. 
He was no Gentile that converted to Judaism. No, he was of the pure chosen race. Of the tribe of Benjamin. This is a massive social status. You may recall Benjamin was the youngest of the two sons to Rachel, Jacob's wife. The other son was Joseph. And if you're familiar with that story from Genesis or Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat, you know how much Jacob favored Rachel and her sons. Being part of the tribe of Benjamin made you a direct relative of Saul, the first king of Israel, and Mordecai. And when the promised land was divided among the 12 tribes of the holy city, Jerusalem was included in the tribe of Benjamin. So being of this tribe was a massive social status. Paul says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul stayed true to his roots in religion. He didn't become one of those Jews that incorporated in the Greco-Roman culture. No, he stayed focused on, was undefiled. You're not going to find any evidence that Paul had compromised on his faith or culture. As to the law, Paul's a Pharisee. See, these were the religious elites of their day. They were highly respected. They separated themselves from everybody else and kind of looked down at everyone as unclean. Essentially, they were religious celebrities of their time. As to zeal, Paul was a persecutor of the church. He oversaw the first martyr that was killed, Stephen. He, Paul literally ripped people out of their homes, separated families, threw them in jail. Paul wanted to crush a Christian church. He, was, he had zeal. As to a legalist, he was righteous. Paul's not saying that he was without sin, but all outward appearances, Paul was a model Jew. You would have been hard-pressed to make a religious accusation against Paul and win. So Paul says, you want to put your faith in things you can do, works you can accomplish? If you think you can do that, look at my life. Look what I've done. But this gives me no confidence. You see, I, you're grossly mistaken if you think I'm putting my hope and my trust in those things. Grossly mistaken. In fact, he says, he goes beyond that. He says, not only do I not put my trust in this, he goes, I consider all those things rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ. Now, our sensitive Christian ears have a, we've, 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 um, we've lightened that word rubbish. The actual word, the Greek word is skubalon. I mean, it it means dog excrement is what it means. And we've, we've kind of cleaned it up for us. I mean, Paul is saying, listen, he's not saying um, that his family history, his culture, his heritage, and accomplishments are pointless, but he's saying compared to the saving faith in Jesus Christ, these things are pointless. None of that stuff matters. All of these works, all of our history, all the history of where you were born, who you were born to, none of that matters compared to knowing Christ. And it doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. Friends, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and let's not miss it. Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. It is not by works. It is not by accomplishments. It's not by where you were born Paul is imploring this to his church to stand against the mindsets of those who have infiltrated the church and were teaching a false gospel. This false gospel was stealing joy, causing disunity, and there was nothing more serious than that. There is nothing more serious than that. Salvation is found by grace alone through Christ alone. So he kind of launches off on these, these people, calls them dogs, tells them, Listen, you want, you want to put your confidence in the flesh? Look at me. He goes through that, and then he, then he takes a breath, and he gets to verse 12, and he goes, okay. He says, look, guys, I'm not perfect. Well, I may understand some things, and I may have a special anointing, and I may have encountered Jesus Christ face-to-face on the road to Damascus. He goes, I, I, I'm not perfect. He says, but what I do No, is I lay hold of Christ. That's what I do. Church, that's that's what Paul is telling us to do. He says, we're not perfect. He's not perfect, but we lay hold of Christ for our salvation. 
So what does that mean, Paul? What does that mean to lay hold of Christ? He kind of gives us two pointers. If you're laying hold of Christ, you'll see these two things in your life. You'll forget about your past failures. Paul oversaw murder, as we discussed. He ripped people from their homes. But because he had been forgiven, he presses forward to what God has has for him in his future. Might be some here today just need to hear that. You need to hear, if you've repented and put your trust in Jesus Christ, you need to let go of your past failures. You need to press forward for what Christ has in you. That's what it means to lay hold of Christ. Oh, how much Satan in our own conscience loves to remind us of these failures. Paul saying, Mosaic, repent, accept God's forgiveness, and now move forward with Christ. Second thing, when we lay hold of Christ, we set our minds on heavenly things. Paul stops focusing on earthly accomplishments and earthly rewards. He says, with tears, that those who don't do this end up living as enemies of the cross. Paul explains to the church, if you're living for yourself, your comforts, your agenda, your glory, then you're living as an enemy of the cross. Paul loved this church and it broke his heart to see them get led astray by a false gospel of works righteousness that sets their minds on earthly matters and render them, renders them no use to the kingdom. You know, as humans, we get easily distracted. We get distracted by news, social media, our finances, our health, relationships. And oftentimes these distractions cause us to take our eyes off Christ. How many of us have been worried about the world this week? Or our finances? Or the price of gas and groceries? Fear can easily creep in. It can absolutely cripple us if we don't set our minds on heavenly things. Paul says... Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. To take hold of Christ is to forget your past and set your mind on heavenly things. So what does this mean for us today in this local church and for Christians around us today. I mean, let's be honest. I don't, I, I've never had anyone come up to me and say, you know, I'm really struggling. Do I need to become a Jew first in order to become a Christian? I, it's just, that's just not something that, that really comes up, right? That's not an issue for our time and in this culture. Circumcision and the law are not hot topics that really, and they really haven't been for, for a long time. So then how does this apply to us? What are What's the overarching point of chapter 3? It's that to warn the church against those who are stealing joy by disrupting unity and teaching a false gospel. How does that apply to us today? What are the type of false gospels that come into our church and our circumstance? And how can we avoid that from happening right here in this body? I see three things we can do. Paul lays them out pretty clear. In order to have joy, in order to stay unified, in order to be one, if we're going to reject a false gospel, if we're going to stay unified and have joy, we need these things. First, and this goes back to, like I said before, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, this is the hinge of the entire book. Paul's pointing back to it. He says, be like-minded, church. Be like-minded. Now, he's not saying everybody here has to have the same interests, hobbies, you know, like the same food. He's not not talking about that. He's saying, have the same mind regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be like-minded regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do we believe that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone? If you've been in a Protestant church for a while, you might automatically say, yeah, of course I believe that. I don't, I don't believe that we can, I can earn my way to heaven or I'm not holding on to a workspace righteousness or I'm not looking to something that I've done and, and using that as, as a pointer to, 
to whether or not I'm saved. But let me ask you this. Have you ever caught yourself saying, man, a good Christian would never buy that house, drive that car. A good Christian would never send their kids to that school. A Christian would never go to that church. A Christian would never vote for that candidate. A Christian would never associate with those people or commit that sin. You see, while you and I likely don't struggle with the issue of adding the Jewish law to our Christ, we do struggle with adding the cultural Christian law to our Christ. Just like those in Philippi, we want to have something that we can point to that we either did or didn't do as the reason for our justification. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that theology and obedience don't matter. But what I am saying is don't let our cultural norms and preferences take precedent over Scripture. That is not going to save us. The Bible is clear on what matters. Galatians chapter 5, Paul lays it out pretty clear. He says, The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, adultery, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and this I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If the trajectory of your life is one of immorality, envy, jealousy, rage, hatred, impurity, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But be careful here. It's not just the voidance. It's not just not having something in your life that is a signal to whether or not you're in Christ. It's what's in your life is the signal on whether or not you have Christ. Moving on, the fruit of the Spirit is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Sometimes as Christians, we want to look at our lives and say, well, I don't do X, I don't do Y, I don't do Z. And that's good, maybe, but that's not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate point is that do our lives reflect the fruit of the Spirit? Do our lives look like Christ? When people encounter us, do they, do they feel love? Do they feel joy? Do they feel, are we patient? Is there self-control? See, it's less about what we don't have and more about what we do have in our lives. Paul says that those who belong to Christ live this way. Those who have the Spirit display the fruit of the Spirit. Like-minded Christians who are full of joy know that we are all sinners saved by grace. We cannot add to it and we cannot take it away. Don't run the risk of being like the dogs found in our text this morning who are trying to add to the cross. Theology matters big time. And our theology is it is finished. Joy is found in being like-minded. Secondly, If we want to avoid the risk of having a false gospel infiltrate our lives and cause division and wreck our joy, we need to have have the same love for one another. Church, let's be honest. The last two years haven't been easy. Haven't been easy in our churches. Haven't been easy in our culture. The hurtful and vile things that are being said to each other, either face-to-face or on social media, are devastating. The lack of love for one another has caused a massive wedge in our faith. In fact, we now have a group of people who are called ex-evangelicals. These are people who have left the evangelical church because they have said the church is unloving. Right, wrong, or indifferent, we, including me, haven't treated each other very well, and as a result, some have walked away. This lack of love and unity toward one another, it's not only sad, it's dangerous to the soul. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says there are six things that God hates, but the seventh is detestable to him. 
Six things are haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, and a false witness. The seventh that's detestable to him is a person who stirs up dissension amongst the church. It's a serious warning. It's a special kind of sin that will face a special type of punishment. Paul isn't imploring us to be loving and having the same love to one another just so we can get along and be kind. No, he's imploring us because it has eternal ramifications. Last week, Pastor Eric gave us an amazing message, and he made a point about regarding unity, and he said, pride causes us to sit back and wait. But Jesus calls us to initiate You can sit back and go, you know, they're more wrong than me, so they should come and apologize to me. Or you can reach out to them and love them and seek to love them. Paul says it this way, as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Church, if we want to have joy and be united by embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we must be of the same love for one another. Last point. If we want to reject a false gospel, if we want to have joy and unity, we need to be one in the spirit and purpose here at Mosaic. In his book, Until Unity, Francis Chan writes this, to our broken church family, we... The Christian church is the most divided faith group on earth, and there isn't a close second. If you think I'm exaggerating, name another religion with more than two or three factions. We have thousands of denominations and ministries, each believing their theology or methodology is superior. The saddest part of this is our Savior was crucified to end our divisions, command us to be united, and says we will impact the world when we become one. He concludes his thought with this, quote, we need to stop thinking our primary duty toward our fellow believers is to critique them. It is not. Our primary duty is to love them, end quote. Jesus said it this way, every kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Church, are you striving to be one in spirit with one another? One in spirit and purpose. Are you willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with one another and your leaders as you seek to carry out the purpose of this church? Because there is a reality here that no church divided against itself will stand. Now, God will always have a remnant. And he will ultimately win the war, but Satan can win some battles along the way and tear down some churches as he goes. I'm sure you're like me and you've been paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine and the war that's ravaging that country. One of the amazing themes that have been coming out of this is how united the Ukrainian people are. The spirit of unity and purpose is having a major effect and it's motivating others to action. Other countries that appear to be now more than ever willing to support the people of Ukraine because they've been inspired by the spirit of these Ukrainians as they stand unified. Friends, whether we know it or not, we're in a spiritual battle every day. Every day the evil one seeks to destroy our marriages, our families, and churches as the world looks on. Are we going to just lay down our arms and give up, or are we going to fight to be one in spirit and purpose? As the worship team comes, I want to remind you the heart and the point of Philippians chapter 3 is that our citizenship is in heaven. And this citizenship was purchased by the blood of the Lamb so that we can now rest in the words of our Savior. It is finished. And I leave you with this. This is Jesus' prayer in John 17. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their, mes- through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. 
may that also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Amen.